Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Amen. So good to uh, be back with you and uh, to share this message. If you have the Bible, open it please to uh, Jeremiah. Jeremiah 20. I've got something to live up to now. No, only my calling, only my calling. Uh, if you've got a Bible, please turn to Jeremiah chapter 20, a message entitled, Making Peace with My Circumstances. There are many uh, characters in the Bible that had to make peace with their circumstances because what God was allowing them to go through was actually difficult for them to bear. And in that way, when we read the Scriptures, we can connect with a, a lot of their experiences. But if there's one person that jumps out of the page uh, to me on this, it's the prophet Jeremiah. He's in the Old Testament. And I want to read a, a few verses as we begin from Jeremiah chapter 20, uh, verses 1 and 2. Jeremiah 21 and 2. When the priest Pashur, son of Emma, the official in charge of the temple of the Lord, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things, he had Jeremiah the prophet beaten and put in stocks at the upper gate of Benjamin at the Lord's temple. So Jeremiah, uh, we did a series, Babylon, that's Daniel. Jeremiah prophesied at the time of um, Israel, uh, uh, Judah's kind of um, entry into Babylon where they were overtaken by the Babylonians. And Jeremiah preached the message contrary to the other prophets at the time. The other prophet says, hey, this isn't going to last very long if it happens at all. Jeremiah said, don't listen to those people. This is going to last 70 years. We will be taken from our homeland and we'll be, we'll be taken to the land of our enemies, and all of this is under God's watchful eye, and God has ordained this. It was not a popular message, so he was oppressed, he was persecuted, um, and he was opposed at every turn. And, and this is what you see. He was beaten. This is not the only time this happened. We see a number of chapters later, chapter 37, the exact same thing happens. They were angry with Jeremiah. Why? Because of this message, and had him beaten, same word, and imprisoned in the house of Jonathan, the secretary, which they had made into a prison. Jeremiah was put into a vaulted cell in a dungeon where he remained a long time. A lot of Jeremiah's story is caught up with the struggle between being faithful to the message that God had given him to preach and the experience that he had as a result of that. And he wrestles over and over again with the circumstances. Now, he, he, in chapter 20, he's beaten by Peshur and, and everybody else. He's released. But as he's being released, verses 3 through 6, he just tells them what he's thinking. He, he tells them, What's going to happen? He said, Peshur, how you have terrorized me, Babylon will terrorize you, and you will die in that country. Now, you would think that this kind of courageous, bold prophet who just kind of vented to these people would be so strong that he wouldn't wrestle in private with what he's bold with in public. But that's not the way it is. Even bold people, courageous people, sometimes have moments in private where their situation and their circumstances catch up with them, and they wrestle with it. One of the realities that we often talk about is, you know, our Christian faith is more than something we do for one hour a week, or if I'm short, an hour and 15 minutes. If I'm long, it's a little bit longer than that uh, on a Sunday. It's actually a message that we live with each and every day. And the, the, the power of moments like this should be that we get an opportunity to come into the presence of God. And whatever our struggles are, we say, you know, in your presence, our problems disappear. It's not as if they really do. It's that in God's presence, all of our problems become manageable. And what happens in here is that there should be that moment, that glimpse of the beauty of Jesus that, that basically helps us deal with our circumstances. And then we leave this place, and the real challenge is, what do we do when nobody else is around? That's the wrestle that Jeremiah had, and we see that in what happens next, in, in verse 7. He's on his own. He's been courageous in public, and now in private, he's just having that moment where he's wrestling with his circumstances. I wonder how many of you can identify with this. But look at what he says, verse 7. You deceived me, Lord, and I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I am ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. 
Now, it's easy to misunderstand verse 7. Jeremiah says, you've deceived me and I've been deceived. The idea here could be that uh, God has told Jeremiah something and that hasn't happened. But, but that's actually not the case. The deception is based on something else. If you have a look at uh, Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 19, it, it is pretty clear from God's call to Jeremiah that God told Jeremiah from the very beginning that he would be beaten. Jeremiah 1, 19, they will fight against you. The word fight there is the word beaten. They will beat you. They will beat you, but they will not overcome you, for I am with you, and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. So it begs the question, what is Jeremiah actually struggling with then? He, he's not struggling with the fact that he's being beaten, and he's wrestling with it. What is he struggling with? I think Jeremiah is struggling with this. Jeremiah is struggling with the weight of his suffering and the weight for God's promises. See, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 19, God says, Jeremiah, they will beat you. But in verse 18, God says to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, I will make you a fortified city. I will make you an iron pillar, and I will make you as bronze walls. Jeremiah, I will make you strong. Jeremiah is struggling because God promised to make him strong, and under the weight of his suffering, he just doesn't feel like it. See, the weight of his suffering is so great, and it feels like God is taking too long. God, why am I still dealing with this? Remember, Jeremiah ministered for 40 years and he experiences this over and over again. God, you promised to make me strong. You promised to deliver me. You promised to do so much for me. And I'm waiting for it. Jeremiah is struggling in the delay. He's struggling with the delay. He's been promised so much. So his struggle is really physical. He's in physical pain. His struggle is emotional. His struggle is psychological, mental. His struggle is spiritual. Many of you know that feeling because those are your struggles too. Sunday, August 20, I kind of stood in the chapel. Most of you come to this service, you were there with me. I was about a minute in. We were in the chapel because a power, struck, a power a cut or something, a power surge, it hit one of the servers that actually drive this room. We couldn't do this room. We had to move into the chapel. A number of you uh, came in there. Thankfully, Dwayne managed to jump the AC. We could get the AC going, and it was a real stressful morning. I'm about a minute into my sermon, and my head just explodes. All I can say is it was like a bomb went off in my head. I preached through the entire sermon. At the end of it, I went to Travis and uh, Laurie. They were by the kids' check-in area, and I said, guys, my head, I've got the worst headache I've ever had in my life. I went into the car, and I said the same thing to Vipka, and Vipka's like, Craig, tell me what it's like. And I was like, Vipka, all I can explain it to you is, um, it, it's like there's so much pressure in my head that at any moment, blood is just going to spurt through my ears and my nose. I said another way of describing this is, you know, sometimes we have a big pot of water, Vipka, and uh, you have a big pot of water and you try to walk with it, and you, you know, you're trying to balance the whole thing. I, I kind of feel like when I put my head down, it's as if I move the pot too quick and everything kind of sloshes around. Vipka's like, Craig, that's not good. You've got to go to the hospital. But I'm a man. <laughs> More like, Vipka, there's no way we're going to the hospital her appendix had burst the previous week. She got out of hospital on Thursday. There's no way I'm going back in there. She said, great, but that isn't right. I said, Vipka, it's probably a migraine. The only headache I've ever had in my life is when I've waited an extra hour for coffee. <laughs> it's probably nothing. She's like, this ain't nothing. I said, look, let's just see how this thing goes. Went home, tried to lay down, couldn't lay down, couldn't do anything. My son comes over, he calls the tele doc. He's like, look, that sounds like an aneurysm. He needs to go to the hospital. So I go into the hospital. They ask me some questions. And uh, of course, I just answer playing everything down. And the doctor looks and says, well, we're going to do a CAT scanning case, but it just looks like it's going to be, a, uh, going to be you know, a migraine or something. And I'm like, duh, see? <laughs> they do the CAT scan, comes back. He comes straight in. He said, you're going straight to Grand Rapids. You've got a brain bleed, and uh, you're going to be in intensive care, and we've got to do more tests, see where all this is coming from. This is not good. 
So I kind of going, I said to Vipka, my son was there as well, I said to them, Larry Chair, the eldest was great, he was there at the same time as well. <clears throat> and uh, they, uh, they were there, I said, hey guys, you go home, there's nothing much you can do through the night, just get a good night's sleep. Remember, Vipka didn't just get out of the hospital and uh, taken in by ambulance, I was put in there, and I got in there, and they said, look, uh, for what you've got, uh, typically you're in for 14 to 21 days, and the average is 17, so you need to just prepare for the fact you're gonna be in here for a while. Now, this is where my challenge came. I can't. Wait a minute, we've got team night on the 23rd. <laughs> we got the preview of the chapel service on the 27th, we got so many things going down. I've got my son's wedding on September the 1st. I'm supposed to be doing it. I can't be in here that long. And they looked at me and they said, well, September the 1st, 12 days, that's a pretty good target to have, but we just want to set your mind on the fact that between 14 and 21 is kind of normal and 17 is when you'll be in. And in that moment, everything's going through my mind. God, can't. And in those moments, I did not have peace with my circumstances. I had anything but. And so what I'm going to share with you here is basically a couple of the lessons that God was teaching me about making peace with your circumstances when you don't seem to be in control of them. And I'm sure that's something that many of us can identify with. So what was the Lord teaching me through this? Uh, firstly, as I'm in there processing all of this, God is teaching me, hey, Craig, do you struggle the right way? If you want to make peace with your circumstances, then do struggle, you struggle the right way. Look at verses 8 through 10. This is what we read. This is Jeremiah again. Whenever I speak, I cry out proclaiming violence and destruction, so the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. Why? Because he was called to preach a message that nobody wanted to hear. And if they didn't want to hear it, they told him he was wrong. They opposed him at every turn. But if I say, I will not mention his word or speak anymore in his name, why would he do that? Jeremiah wanted peace. He found it really difficult not having peace with the circumstances. He found his situation really too difficult to bear. And so he wrestled with this in his mind. And remember, this is a prayer time. And he's wrestling with this in his mind. And he's saying, God, one option I've got is actually to stay quiet and say nothing. After all, I've already said enough. This is 20 chapters. But then he says, and we can read it, he says, his word in my heart is like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I'm weary of holding it in. In other words, not speaking is actually so hard it tires me out. So he says, indeed, I cannot. But this is his problem, and this is where, this is where I found myself. I hear many whispering, terror on every side. Denounce him. Let's denounce him. All my friends are waiting for me to slip, saying, perhaps he will be deceived. Then we will prevail over him and take our revenge on him. The phrase that jumped out at me there was, they are waiting for me to slip. They are waiting for me to fall. Many of you, when Vipka and I were going through this, we had a fun week, um, a fun month. When we were going through this, many of you said, hey, this is a spiritual attack. And I certainly see it as a time of spiritual testing. But when I was in there, in the ICU, trying to process, okay, why is all of this happening? What is, what is going on here? A thought went into my mind, and it was, what if they're right? See, what had come to my attention was that there were a few people, only a small number of people, okay? But of course, one or two people can actually become one or two hundred when you're actually thinking about it, right? One or two people who do not like what we're doing with this water's edge stuff with, um, you know, with a family of church approach, uh, they don't like that because it's challenging the way denominations think about doing their ministry. A couple of people, just a couple of them, ha had basically said, we can't wait for him to fall. We can't wait for him to fall, fall like the last guy. And all it takes is one or two people a weak, vulnerable moment in your mind, and it goes in there. Because isn't it often the case that when we struggle, one of the questions we ask ourselves is why? Why am I going through this? 
God, are you trying to teach me something through this? And before long, if you're not careful, you try to go through all of the little things that you could possibly have done that would have led you to a situation that you're in. And that's where I was. And all of a sudden, the words of one or two became like one or two thousand in my own mind. It was like, are they right? And it was in that moment that the, I just sensed the, the Spirit of God remind me of, of this particular text. God is with me. And I said, God, I, I know that you're with me. And if I'm opposed for doing your will, then let the opposition come, because I cannot do anything else. But then I found myself saying this. But Lord, is it too much to ask that other people be with us as well? And it was in that moment, something I'd read through the summer jumped back at me. It was something Jonathan Edwards had said, that old uh, preacher. And he said that often it's the case, especially when we go through crisis or struggle, the Christians want Christ to be useful and forget that he's beautiful. We want a Christ who is useful in our struggle, and when he's not, or when he delays, or when he allows us to go through struggle, we forget that he's always beautiful. Edwards said that we have a twofold knowledge of good that God has permitted us to know. One is rational, we can know it in our head, but the other is that internal and deep knowledge that's based on the real intimacy with God of who He is, and Edward said, of His holiness. Edward said there's a world of difference between knowing that honey is sweet and having tasted it and had the sense of its sweetness. And what struck me in that moment was that when I was going through struggle, thinking about the words of one or two people, pushed me to wanting a useful Christ rather than worshiping a Christ who was always beautiful, irrespective of what I was going through. Have you ever been there? How many of you have found yourself in a situation where you've struggled with a delay, and one of the things we do in the delay is we basically try and wrestle our way through this thing, try to understand those things that are not being revealed to us, because who can honestly repent of a sin that has not been revealed? And then we find ourselves going through all of this, and where we find ourselves is wanting Christ to be useful and forgetting that He's always beautiful. One of the ways we find peace in our circumstances is remembering no matter what we go through, Christ is always beautiful. Is actually satisfying ourselves on His sweetness, on His wonder, on His goodness, on the power of the finished work of Jesus. And so in that moment, I just put, pushed it out of my side and I said, God, I know that you are for me and that is enough for me. That's how we find peace peace in our circumstances, peace in the delay. We find peace in our delay by fighting the right way, not the wrong way. And all too often we want a Christ that is useful, and we forget that Christ is always beautiful. My prayer for you is that you would have an encounter with Christ, that He would always be beautiful to you, no matter what you go through. Secondly, the next step with this is I then had to realize that I am a victim, not a victim. Because of Christ, I am a victim, not a victim. L look at what happens here with Jeremiah. He's gone through this struggle, and then he says, but the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior, so my persecutors will stumble, they will not prevail. They will fail and be thoroughly disgraced, their dishonor will never be forgotten. Lord Almighty, you who examine the righteous and probe the heart and mind. See, God does that. God probes us. He reveals what we need to acknowledge. Let me see your vengeance on them, for to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord. Give praise to the Lord. He rescues the life of the needy from the hands of the wicked. For all of his pain, 
For all of these talks, all of this talk about people wanting him to fail, he recognizes, wait a minute, I am not a victim here. I am ultimately a victor. And he speaks the word of God to himself. As I was going through this, the Lord brought back a time of prayer that Vipka and I went through. In about the, it was about a month before we went through what we did. Vipka was about to take a group of people to the Celebrate Recovery Leaders Training Summit, and we were praying together at home. And as we were praying together at home, we finished, and Vipka stopped, and she said, uh, Craig, I just get a sense through the Holy Spirit that you and I are going to go through a season of personal testing, and God wants you to know it's going to be okay. Tell you what, in that moment, that living word of God that is sharper than any two-edged sword came alive to me, and I just realized I am not a victim. I am a victor through Christ Jesus. Now, some of you may say, Craig, I'm going through a crisis right now, and I've not had a word like that. I want to tell you, yes, you do. Whether you're holding your Bible and you're on your phone, new technology, or whether you're holding a Bible with older technology, folks, that's all it is, technology. Whether you're holding it in new technology or old technology, the Bible says that the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword that can pierce joint and marrow. You have the living Word of God at your disposal, and the responsibility of the Spirit of God is to take the will of God in the Word of God and reveal it to you as sons and daughters of God. But the question is, do you have the capacity to hear His voice? Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. Heard a pastor explain it. And it jumped out at me because Vipka does the same thing. The, the pastor said, hey, when I call my wife, she answers the phone and goes, hey. Any of your wives do that? Hey. Now, when Vipka does that, I don't go, or when Vipka calls me and I answer it and she says, hey, I don't say, who is this? <laughs> I don't need to look at caller ID to see who this is. I know Vipka's, Hey. I've listened to it for 30 years. <laughs> the point being, when you are in the Word of God regularly, and you are listening and reading the Word of God regularly, when you are allowing the Word of God to read you regularly, you get to the point of knowing His voice. You know that when you read God's promises, they are for you because you're in the Word so much that you know His voice. You don't need to ask, hey, God, is that from you? Because you know His voice. I've listened to Vibka's voice for 30 years. Some of you can try and imitate that. If you want, it won't work. <laughs> you're like, yeah, what does she sound like? Yeah, what do I sound like? But it's the same thing with God. It's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. There is an assurance that is given to believers that when we engage God in His Word, the Spirit takes the living Word of God and breathes it to us. So that in those moments where we need it, it will suddenly come back to our memory as the living Word of God that it is. The way to make peace with your circumstances is actually to make peace with your circumstances before you ever go through them. It's to open up God's Word and get in God's Word, to feed off God's Word, to bring yourself to the point that you hear God's voice. We make peace with our circumstances when we see ourselves as victors, not victims, and that comes through recognizing that no matter what happens, we all win in the end. That's what God's Word says. And what we need in a crisis is basically to have that assurance from the Holy Spirit that can come to us. Yes, from a, a word from the Holy Spirit in a time of prayer with a spouse or a friend, but it can also come on our own as we open up God's Word and say, God, just speak to my soul. Because what I know in my head, I need to know in my heart. I need to know not simply that you are useful, but you are beautiful to me. This is what Jeremiah does. He speaks God's word to himself. But thirdly, it's never that easy to stay there. We have to keep going back there over and over again. And so thirdly, I found myself needing to ensure that I guard my mind and my heart. It's fascinating. Having just spoken God's word to himself and acted like a victor, the next minute he's down the other way again. 
Cursed be the day I was born. May the day my mother bore me not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought my father the news, who made him very glad, saying, a child is born to you, a son. May that man be like the towns the Lord overthrew without pity. May he hear wailing in the morning, a battle cry at noon. Aren't you glad that God doesn't answer some of our stupid prayers? For he did not kill me in the womb with my mother as my grave. Her womb enlarged forever. Why did I ever come out of that womb to see trouble and sorrow and to end my days in shame? Man, he's up and down like a yo-yo. What does that tell us? This life is a dynamic thing. It's not as if we speak God's word to us once. God's word comes to us once and that's it. That's all we need. The sad thing for many of us is we're living off the day we were converted and we've never actually pressed into God to have another encounter like that. In those times in the hospital of stillness, I was not allowed technology. It was awful. I couldn't even read a book. I read so many books. Couldn't even read. Just had to lay there. For someone who likes using their mind, the worst thing that you can possibly do is stillness. There's a pastor friend of mine, and we joke that one of the worst things that a church can do for us is to send us on a silent retreat. (laughs) He said he did it once, seven days, he had to take his phone, put it off to one side, and he said the first three days were like purgatory. Just being still, being silent, because the minute you're still and silent, that's where your mind starts to go. And so there I am in this room, couldn't have technology, simply laying there, couldn't read, and I'm like, okay, what do I do now? Mind starts to go. Pastor Mike came in, I think he was on the Monday afternoon, and he says, "Uh, so, no technology, huh? How's it going? I'm like... Mike, see that clock on the wall? He's like, yeah. I said, it's two degrees off center. (laughs) He's like, shall I change it for you? I'm like, no, don't. Purgatory is really good for me right now. (laughs) And then I said, Mike, you know what's interesting? I said, "Um, between the hours of 1.01 p.m. and 4.01 p.m., That second hand is stuck between 54 seconds and 55 seconds. But the minute it gets to 4.01 p.m., that second hand is free and kind of circumnavigates that entire clock until 1.01 p.m. the next day. And then for some reason, Mike, it just stops. And I'm really intrigued as to why. It is actually really easy to keep yourself busy so that you don't think about your circumstances. Any of you with us? And then when you are forced to be still, stillness will expose whether your heart is at peace. I took my comfort in being distracted by a clock. Funny thing, this morning I went into the green room over there, haven't been in there for a while, and it was six minutes slow. (laughs) Six weeks that I was last in there, that clock slows one minute at a time, and it's digital. So what did I do? I got up, I changed it to the right time. We distract ourselves. But when the Lord brings us to a point of being still, That's when we know whether we are really at peace. So what do we do when we're woken up in the middle of the night and what's the worst thing that happens when you wake up in the middle of the night? You start to think. I got to the point when I start to think I get up, I do stuff for two hours and then I go back to bed. What God was teaching me there is, Craig, you need to guard your heart and your mind and there's a different way of doing this. And the Lord took me to a passage, you're not going to see it on the screen. I'd love you to look at this in your Bible for yourself if you can. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Because I believe this is a passage that some of you need to meditate on. Philippians 4, 6 and 7 is what Paul says. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, 
uh, present your requests to God. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So I'm struggling with the silence, struggling with the stillness, and this verse comes to me. And I just sense God teaching me three things. First, Craig, the way for nothing to destroy your peace is for everything to lead to prayer and thanksgiving. The way for nothing to destroy your peace is for everything to lead to prayer and thanksgiving. If you have a look at this verse, the verse says that for us to be anxious about nothing, we need to learn to pray and thank about everything. And then verse 7 begins with the word and. Now, in the Greek, this word and is what you call consecutive. It basically means the result is. So in your Bible, as you look at this, replace the word and with the words the result is. Listen to how it goes. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the result is the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now, a number of you are thinking, Craig, I've done that, and it doesn't work, and this is where the next part of the verse is really important. Prayer and thanksgiving lead us to where peace is found. Prayer and thanksgiving are not where peace is found. Prayer and thanksgiving are the tools that lead us to where peace is found. Now, where is peace found? In God. This is the peace of God. Another way of saying that is this is the peace that comes from God. Just like God is love, so God is peace. This peace symbolizes and summarizes the calm that characterizes the very nature of God. And so no matter what happens, God is always peace. God radiates tranquility in every situation because he is peace. And the Bible says that prayer and thanksgiving are the tools that lead us to the place, the person in whom peace is found. So thirdly, the Lord was revealing to me that peace is found in a person, not in a practice. The only hearts and minds that are guarded are the hearts and minds of those who are pursuing God and finding God, look at the last two words of verse 7, in Christ. The peace of God is found in one person and in one person only. The way to find true peace, lasting peace in our circumstances is in Christ. And so the question is, do you know Christ? Are you in Christ? Let me just say this. The heart of the, of the Christian faith is union with Christ. Paul uses that phrase, in Christ, 164 times. In Ephesians, he uses it 36 times. The heart of Ephesians is that this ragtag group of people that were struggling to get along, by the way, do you know they had worship wars? That's why Paul says, hey, whether you sing psalms or whether you sing hymns or whether you sing spiritual songs, which is basically somebody doing free flow, which is kind of what Hannah and Jeremy do at some point, uh, whatever you do, it it kind of all is done in Christ. They'd worship wars over this because there's only one way to worship. This ragtag group of people had actually been picked up and placed in Christ. See, the heart of the Christian faith is not whether Jesus lives in you, it's actually whether you are in Christ. And if you are in Christ, then Christ is in you because Paul says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And if Christ lives in you, then Christ is living his life through you. What type of Christ that, uh, life did Christ live? He lived an incredible life of communion with God, made possible not simply because he was God, but by the Spirit of God that revealed God's will to him in his life as a man. Jesus did not do the things he did because he was God. He did them because the Spirit of God revealed to him as the Son of God what he needed to do as the man of God. It's the same thing for you and me. How did Jesus live? He lived with God, and then he lived a life that was willing to embrace suffering, go to a cross, Die? Why? Because he knew the end. How do, we, how do we guard our minds and our hearts? By recognizing 
that, yes, Jesus is in me, but more importantly, I am in Christ. And because I am in Christ, the parallel term that Paul uses, I am with Christ. And if you look at that phrase, for those of you who want to dig deeper into this, with Christ, you will see that there are two terms that always come up with this phrase, with Christ. It's death and resurrection. Now, how did Jesus live in that period before he was going to the cross? He struggled with the delay just like Jeremiah did. He struggled with the delay just like I did. He struggled with the delay just like many of us do. We see it here. Hebrews 12. Let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Here we go. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Jesus struggled with the delay. That's why he was in Gethsemane down on his knees saying, Father, if it is your will, please take this cup from me. John tells us that he was so distressed, he sweat drops of blood. But he carried on. Yet not my will, but your will be done. Why did he say that? Because he knew the end. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, because he knew he would one day sit down at the right hand of the throne of God. And then we are encouraged. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Friends, it is so easy to lose heart in the delay. What do we do? We offer prayer and thanksgiving in everything. Why? Because those practices lead us to the place where Peace is found. Peace is found in God. It leads us to the person of Jesus who endured the cross so that the penalty of sin would be paid for once and for all and that peace would be made, a price would be paid for sin so that we could have this relationship with God that would enable us to endure anything that we go through. As I was thinking about this, I was thinking about the fact that all of this may be true, but how, how does it help us in the delay? Craig, I believe all of this to be true, but I'm struggling in my delay. Why, why does God allow me to delay? I, I don't know the answer for every personal story here. I don't know why God allows some of us to go through what we're going through. I don't know why God allowed me to go through what I went through or Vipka to go through what we went through. I don't know that. I, I'll never know that, but I, I do know this. There is another man in the Bible who struggled with the delay. It's John the Baptist. John the Baptist was very much like John, preached the message of repentance that was needed and influential people didn't like it, so the king threw him in prison. Matthew chapter 11 tells us that John sent his disciples to Jesus to ask whether Jesus was the Messiah or whether John should wait for someone else. Now remember, the Spirit of God had revealed to John the Baptist at the time of Jesus' baptism that Jesus was the Messiah. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He knew who Jesus was, and yet he's struggling. Why? Because he's struggling with the delay. He's struggling under the weight of his calling, the weight of his suffering, and the weight for God's promise. He was there too. And so he goes in that pressure, he goes to Jesus. The best thing you can do with your wrestle, by the way, is to go and ask Jesus. He goes to Jesus through the disciples and says, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Matthew 11 is a brilliant chapter. Jesus answers by saying, okay, tell John what you see in here. The good news is being preached. The blind can see, the deaf can hear, the lame can walk. And then they go back to John the Baptist. Jesus recognizes that that's not going to be enough for John. Because in the next part of the verse, of the, of the gospel, of the chapter, what we read is, after the disciples have gone, Jesus turns to the crowds and he says, I tell you this, of all of the men born of women, none is greater than John. Why did he say this? He said this because he knew that John would struggle 
because he knew that John would recognize what Jesus did. You see, when Jesus burst onto the scene, gave his manifesto, he said, listen, good news would be preached, the deaf would hear, the lame would walk, the blind would see, Luke chapter 4, and the prisoners would be set free. What did Jesus say in Matthew 11? The deaf hear, the lame walk, the blind see, good news is being preached, go tell John. You can hear John saying, wait a minute, the part of this thing is that people are gonna be set free from oppression. But Jesus, I'm still in prison. One of the fundamental differences between the Jewish understanding of the kingdom of God and the Christian understanding of the kingdom of God is that the Jews expected when the Messiah came, judgment would come upon evil and God's kingdom would be established all at once. It was kind of like a one is done. God's kingdom comes, God's Messiah comes, God's kingdom comes, God's rule is established, evil is done away with. But what Jesus does is he introduces this idea of a delay. He tells parables, right, about what happens when the servants are gone. And in this portion here, he says, John, you've got to deal with the fact emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, you've got to deal with the fact that what I may do for other people, I may not do for you. And are you okay with that? Am I beautiful enough for you in that? See, John experienced the delay and Jesus says, this delay is a part of God's plan. And it begs the question, why? The next part of that verse, I tell you of all the men born of a woman, no one is greater than John. And then he says, but I tell you, even the least of these is greater than John. How does that work? How can John be better than Abraham, be better than David, be better than Moses, be better than all of these prophets? And the answer is in his position to Jesus. John had the responsibility of pointing people to Jesus more clearly than anyone else in all of history could. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But you know, John died before the story was done. John died the wrong side of the cross. You and I are greater than John due to our position in salvation history, having come the other side of the cross and had the ability to see how this story truly ends. And so what God was telling John, what God tells Jeremiah, what God was telling me, what God is telling you is God's delay does not mean his denial. The reason for the delay is quite simply summed up in that wonderful hymn of Philippians chapter two. Jesus, being in very nature God, didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped, but humbled himself, took on the form of a servant, became obedient even to death on the cross. But God has exalted him to the, and given him, uh, and put him in the highest place and given him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, what? Every knee will bow to the glory of God the Father. The reason for the delay, the reason why we struggle is that God did not want to bring immediate full judgment at the coming of Christ, allow there to be a delay so that millions and billions of people throughout history would have the opportunity to voluntarily bow the knee to Jesus in this life through us pointing out Jesus clearly even in our struggling so that they will not have to do it involuntarily in the next. That's why there's a delay. And I wonder whether you, like me, are willing to embrace that truth, not just in our head, but to allow the beauty and the wonder of the finished work of Jesus to just drop deep into our soul and to enable us, even in struggle, even in trial, even in crisis, to cling on to the beauty of Jesus and the necessity of our struggle because we want everything in all of history to point to the wonder of Jesus because one day everyone will have to acknowledge it. And if our struggle, if our delay achieves that, won't we embrace it just one more time? Just one more day? Not for our sake, but for their sake and for his. I've asked the team to sing a song that they wrote, and I love the words of this because it it just talks about the struggle. It says, sometimes there's a famine because I failed to store away. Sometimes I'm in a crisis because I just did something stupid. But it also says, sometimes it's because you just choose to hold the rein. 
The wonder of worshiping Jesus is it doesn't matter what we've done. It doesn't matter where we've come from. We all have the beautiful opportunity right now just to acknowledge his beauty. And this song, I think, captures that struggle really well. So what I would encourage you to do is just to engage with this song as the team leads it. These altars are always open. And if you just feel you need to come and, and you just simply need to kneel there to acknowledge his beauty, then, then do that. But as we do that, I pray that we would all just be able to experience the wonder of the peace of Christ in whatever circumstance we find ourselves in. Pray with me. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just bring your word to life in our hearts. For those that are here that are struggling, that don't know why, I just pray that this moment the moment through this song would enable them to bring everything through prayer and thanksgiving to you. And in this moment, Father, because they are in Christ, would you just give them your peace, a peace that passes all understanding and enables them, even through their trial, to just see your beauty in a fresh way. Father, may our love for you drop from our head to our hearts so that our affections would be focused firmly on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Sometimes there's a famine because I failed to store away And sometimes it's because You just choose to hold the rain One thing I am sure of A part that doesn't change You are faithful all the same and Sometimes there's a trial Because I've wandered far away Sometimes it's because you just want to build my faith. This is my assurance that whatever comes my way, you are faithful all the same. I'm in a storm Because I've chosen my own way And sometimes it's because You want to have me walk away But I know for certain It's true that still remains You are faithful all the same
your presence in this room. We surrender before you today, God. We want nothing else but you. Nothing else but your love, God. Take us back to the moment when we first fell in love with you, Jesus. Let us get caught up in your presence. as always thank you for being in this place with us today it's always an honor and a privilege to have you with us to worship the Lord together amen uh, I hope that you're encouraged as you are heading home today uh, the Lord is moving, the Lord, the Lord is doing beautiful things in this place, and I pray that we may have surrendered everything in our hearts this morning before him and before his altar. Amen. I pray you go in peace. Have a beautiful Sunday. Have a beautiful week. We'll see you next week at 9 and 1045 right here in this very room. Have a blessed day.